Hi everyone, I'm Netta. I'm the manager of pre-construction um, uh, for Royal Page Your Community and Connect. Um, bear with me, officially my first course in the academy, so you're all my guinea pigs today, or I'm your guinea pig rather, so, um, so just bear with me. We're going to make this work together. We're going to make it, um, you know, I, I, my intention is to make it as interactive as, as uh, possible, so that if you have any questions, you can ask me, and I'm just going to basically share my experiences with you. Just a little um, tidbit about me. I've been in pre-construction um, and real estate since 2005, and I've done both ends of the spectrum. Um, after I was um, tired of resale, I got into it. From the get-go, actually, I was in pre-construction. I worked uh, at a company where the owner of the company was um, a developer, and so I was exposed from very early on into the world of pre-construction. I was um, at the sales office level um, representing the builder. I also helped with the um, selling of the remainder of the product, resell, um, resell of the leftover units or assignments, if you will. And um, I've done the, um, basically now um, for a few years with with uh, Royal LePage, I've been doing the end where we're representing the builder, we're a pricing product for the developers and um, representing the, um, the, the inside of the project. Um, so I'm just gonna wait for a few yeah. more minutes so everyone can settle down. There's, um, I think we might be able to squeeze in. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Take your time. <laughs> Are we good? I'm popular. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, I know a lot of you are obviously familiar with the world of pre-construction, um, but I'm just going to give a quick overview of what is pre-construction, what, what it entails, um, and um, we'll uh, basically go from there. So pre-construction is when your clients are buying something that hasn't been built in most cases. It does not exist except on paper right now. Um, and this could be a condo apartment, it could be a townhouse, it could even be a detached property. Um, and, and so um, the reason why I have freehold condo um, is because nowadays you're finding that there's a lot of townhouses that are being categorized as freehold. Uh, but there is a condo element there. And what that means is there is potentially a shared road element. For example, it's a complex where the drive in is some is, is, a, is a path that isn't an existing street and so the developer has to create that road and now that road becomes part of the condo corporation where it has to be maintained and the clients and the purchasers will have to pay a maintenance fee for the upkeep of that road um, they also provide um, snow removal garbage disposal <coughs> for that complex and so there's that condo element for that property but the actual structure in the actual house or the townhouse is a freehold without any condo corporation attached to it. Um, the condo apartments are obviously, as you all know, um, where the most fun is to be had. Um, there's a lot of interest there. Um, there's a lot of um, money to, meet, to be made because in most cases they pay but for a 4% commission. I have seen cases of five percent but you know a, a, a project like one bloor for example where it's a really popular project there's a lot of interest there the developer started the project at three percent commission and then later on as the remaining units um, were offered for sale then he increased it to four percent um with most of the detached properties you'll find freehold detached properties you'll find that because for a long period of time they were very popular and people would line up the individual um, basically members of the public would line up for these properties, the developers would not pay commission. They didn't need us to help them move the product, and so they were not paying commission. I have a feeling this might change a little bit, and we're going to start seeing that those detached homes where the, the developer does need um, assistance of the, develop, uh, of, of the real estate population in order to make their product move so that we might see um, commission coming in. 
Um, so in most cases, you'll see basically a floor plan. And this floor plan is going to be, um, a bit, obviously, some, some developers will offer a 3D version of it. So it's a virtual program where you can see the walkthrough of the, the uh, size of the units, the living room, the family room, the kitchen. Some of them actually have models of their kitchen and bathrooms in their sales offices. Um, but a lot of um, times you'll find very minimum. Um, and very minimal basically build up of these things just because pre-construction has gotten so big that developers will spend less and less money about uh, advertising their product. But in most cases, you'll, you, they'll give you a floor plan and you can basically walk your client through the floor plan. In general, most of the basically lingo is the same. So you'll see WD for, you know, washer and dryer and the, um, they might indicate fridge and they might just mark it with you know, an X or whatever. But, you know, in, in, if, if um, um, you go into the sales office and the sales agents of the site can walk you through what each of the um, little squares or the boxes that on the floor plan will mean. But so then your client is purchasing your property off the floor plan and they'll provide you a price list at the sales office level. And this price list in almost 99% of the cases, did you want to grab a chair? Are you sure? Um, in most cases, that uh, price list, the price that you see on the price list is the, for the lowest floor available of that uh, unit and that model. And that the price goes up uh, incrementally based on whatever the floor premium is. Sometimes if the building is very tall, um, they will have a premium mid-building. For example, it's $1,000 per floor starting on the second floor, but on 20th floor, there's a jump of $10,000 and then it will go up $1,000 again per floor. So um, these are things that, again, at the sales office level, the, the sales staff can, can provide you information for. Um, the finishes and the renderings. So the renderings are basically any pictures and artists' um, uh, views and, and visuals that <coughs> is provided of what the finishes would, like, what would look like, what the kitchen would potentially look like, what the lobby would look like. Um, what the gym would look like. So these are all called generally the renderings of the product. Um, the amenities, they'll have renderings of the amenities and amenities could be gym, sauna, swimming pool, if there's a guest suite, if there's a um, um, party room, uh, if there's an outdoor patio area with barbecue units and whatnot. So these are part of the amenities of the building. And you know, in, in some cases, some of them are open. So for example, the gym is open to the residents and they can go in with their using their paw key anytime they wish. Some of them, like the party room, like the guest suite, need to be booked and reserved through the concierge and the building management. And all of those rules and regulations will basically come up once the building is built and um, the um, management staff is on site. Um, the down payment and deposit is basically the money that your client has to submit towards the purchase of this property, just like the down payment that we, uh, or the deposit that we have on our uh, resale product, the developers will dictate to us what sort of down payment they're looking for. Um, with the time, with the condo apartments, we're finding more and more that they're looking at about 20 to 25% deposit. Um, your client does have the option of putting more money down but with the bank. So at closer to the time of their closing, and we'll talk about what closing and what occupancy and all of that means, but closer to the time of closing when they're applying for their mortgage, if they wish to put down more money down for the, the deposit, so they've already given 25% to the uh, developer and the bank will look at that as their down payment and they wish to deposit more to, and so they'll basically put down extra money with the bank so that their mortgage payments can come down that road. Always a, a nice way of keeping their deposits down. Yes, yeah. What's the deposit protection for rebuilds? So generally speaking, at the time of signing, your client will have to submit all these post-dated checks. So with <laughs> most products, you'll find that at signing, they will require um, a check for $5,000. Now, this $5,000 or $10,000, depending on the price of the property, will not be cashed during their rescission period. And that rescission period is the 10-day cooling off period, also referred to as the conditional period. So the developer will hold on to that check. Once the deal is firm, that's when they process your first payment. Third, generally speaking, and this varies from builder to builder, 30 days from the day of signing, 
your client will have to basically come up with another 5% deposit minus that 5,000. So if it says balance of 5,000, 5%, it means your 5% minus the 5,000 or the 10,000 that was submitted at the time of signing. Um, then another, you know, 5% in about um, 60 to 90 days or 120 days. Then another 5% in 180 days or five, you know, it depends on the developer, how generous they are, how much they want to spread it out. So generally speaking, within the first six months or so, the developers are looking to collect about 10% out towards the purchase um, of this property. So 10% deposit is normal uh, within six months. And then it's spread out. So then they might do another 5% of occupancy. Um, and then that might that will add up to your 20 or 25 percent, however much the deposit is. What part is protected under the term? So if you're, you're hypothetically buying a five hundred thousand dollar condo and you're putting 20 percent over the first 60 days. So uh, um, my understanding was that it used to be for 20 to 40 thousand dollars through Terry on. Yes. But they've recently changed that for condo part townhouses. They're yeah, protected up to one hundred thousand dollars. And about um, 60 or 80, if I'm not mistaken, on uh, the condo apartments. And that's something we can confirm through Terry. They recently changed it. I don't know if it's a, an effect yet or not. It was, they were, there was talks of, they, what this means is, um, maybe I can explain this. So there's an entity called Terry And Terry is basically an entity that protects um, the purchasers of new product, new construction. This could be houses, this could be townhouses, this could be apartment buildings. Um, and so the, the Terion will oversee um, that the developer is delivering the product according to the schedule that they've provided, if, uh, the delivery schedule, occupancy period, and <clears throat> their closing falls within that period of time that they've um, delivered to Terion, as well as the fact that in the event your client, uh, the, the developer is not able to deliver the product um, the deposit is somewhat protected and there's an insurance protection on that deposit, as well as the fact once the building is built, um, the um, Terion will uh, allow your buyers to do an inspection prior to taking occupancy, to do another inspection 30 days after it, um, taking over the, uh, uh, the premises, as well as um, I believe there's one at one year uh, term so that if at, at any opportunity, if there's any deficiencies, any structural um, problems with the um, with the unit, then your client has an opportunity to report that, and the developer is responsible to fixing that product for your clients. Um, we can look into during the break. I'll look into yeah, that and we can further talk about it. Um, but that, de sorry, that deposit doesn't go <coughs> to the builder per se, it goes to the lawyer in trust. So yeah, um, with condo apartments where you have <coughs> quite a few units, um, even with townhouses, if you have more than a certain number of units, then developer will uh, basically work with a, a, a lawyer to hold their money in trust. But I'm finding more and more with this smaller products, with the smaller sites where there's 20, 30, um, 40 townhouses, for example, the developer will hold on to that deposit. Yes, it's in their trust, but they're holding on. So the deposit is made directly to the developer. So I've seen that as well. So it doesn't always sit in a, a, a lawyer's account. So we talked about the down payment and deposit. Incentives. So what, what are incentives? So the develop, the, these builders will basically try to make their product as appealing as possible. Number one is their finishes. Number two is their price. Of course, number one is prices. But you know they, they try to make it appealing by having competitive pricing, by having uh, beautiful finishes, as well as uh, providing uh, special incentives. And these incentives could be something uh, similar to having parking a locker included to the in the price of the purchase of this condo apartment, or having the um, assignments or development and levies capped, for example, and I'll talk about what assignments are, so don't worry about it. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, and I'm sure many of you have done assignments, but it's a it's part of a pre-construction, and it's it's actually exciting, but um, very it could be challenging a little bit. But we'll talk about that in um, in um, in a little bit. Um, so these incentives um, are basically something that is not always negotiable. Um, especially at the beginning of the uh, launch of a project, it is set 
just like the prices that um, with the developer, the prices are set. You cannot negotiate prices in most cases. Of course, you know, you always have there. There are that exceptions occasionally that the product is left over and and the builder wants to move them. So they'll they might do something on pricing. They might do something on incentive. But in general, the, what we're seeing nowadays is because there's so much demand, developers don't have to give too, too much. They they give enough to move the products, but that's about it. So in most cases, you won't be able to negotiate at a sales office level. Um, the 10 day rescission period, we kind of touched on that. That's the period in which the uh, um, agreement is conditional. And keep in mind that the most of the sites will basically mark your agreement of purchase and sale um, and, your, and, and, and tell you that, that your 10-day starting, a uh, 10-day cooling off period starts as of now. Um, always, always make sure that the 10-day and, and, and that you communicate that with the sales office, your 10-day or your client's 10-day cooling off period will start from the moment your client gets their package from the developer. So not when they're signing, because not always is there a representative of the builder on site to execute and sign on behalf of the vendor um, and, and hand over a copy of the agreement to your client. So you, they might ask you to leave and you know come back at, at the next day or in a couple of days to pick up your package and your copy of the agreement. Um, that's when the 10 day cooling off period should legally start because that's when your client will have the opportunity to bring that agreement of purchase and sale as well as the uh, disclosure booklet uh, to, to the lawyer to have it reviewed. So that's quite important, yes. Is it a business day? Or no, what? it's never business days, it's regular days. Statutory holidays will count as well, in most cases, Christmas day, um, all of those will count. Developers are a little bit lenient when it comes to the holidays, especially around Christmas and New Year's and whatnot, but you're, you still need to ask for an extension. So an extension is something that is allowed, but you have to ask that within the 10 days you can ask for an extension when the time is up. Um, and at a launch of a development, the, um, the builder might be willing to only do half a day a day, at most a couple of days I've seen. But you know, as the uh, uh, site is, gets a little bit older and there's leftover inventory, they might be a little bit more flexible. I've seen as much as a week of extension, uh, 10 days. Hi. Is um, 10 days um, governed? that it has to be a minimum of 10 days or can a developer say we <coughs> want um, the cooling off period to be five days? Um, so it is it is um, um, governed, but I'm finding I'm that, that right. Um, but I'm finding a, some of the developers nowadays are enforcing a three day period where they're saying, no, my site is a freehold site because in, in most cases, a freehold product when your client signs it, it's firm on the spot, it's freehold. And so if that is the case, um, you can ask for that. And in most cases, they will provide a copy of the agreement prior to it being signed. And so you can have it reviewed before your client signs it. Um, but then the minute they sign it and it's executed, it's firm on the spot for, for uh, freehold properties. But with condos, they must get 10 days. But I found recently that their developer insists on, especially when the uh, market was really hot and they could, you know, sort of push the envelope a little bit. Oh, my product is freehold. I will only give you three days. So, you know, I mean, in a court of law, they could argue that if they wanted to, but it's up to the discretion of your client to take that or not. Yes. Yeah. During the cooling off period, the buyer has a right to cancel the contract without any reason. Yeah. Yes, they usually would like to know for their marketing reason what the reason, what what is the reason you're canceling? Because um, at, having been on the sales uh, site, basically on the inside, we want to know if we can save the deal somehow. Um, so they will ask, and and you're free to give them whatever reason. You know, it, it, a very sort of generic answer is that financing <clears throat> didn't work out. And so they can't really argue that. But if they say, oh, I don't like this layout, then we might try to sell another layout to them. You know, And, and as an agent, you want that deal not to fall apart as much as the, the site uh, staff do. And, um, so yeah, your client does have, even to the last minute of, um, even if the sales office is closed, 
they have until midnight of that evening, the 10th day to cancel. So by email or having your lawyer and your client's lawyer send an email, you can still be off the hook basically. So as soon as you right. sign the contract, you have to give the check? Yes. And, uh, Yes. You, I'll, I'll talk. It? I'll talk about the procedure. Yes. So it's not a legal prerequisite to have ten days of a decision period. It's arbitrary depending on the builder what they establish. It is legal with condo apartments, especially when the, where there's a booklet. The, it is legal. Leave. So it is a legal requirement. So basically, if, if one builder says, "Well, we want to do three days," and your client decides to back out after seven days. Uh, their lawyer would tell them that they have a legal right to that. And basically, they can. I mean, personally, if a if a developer tells me your client only has three days and that my client really badly wants this product, right away I will inform the lawyer that this is what the builder is saying yeah. to us. Can you please address this and make sure that of you have course, in writing? Worst comes to come to worst, you know. If if it happens, they would have a legal right to back out. Yes, if it's a condo product, definitely. Um, so basically the way it works is when you walk into the sales office, I'll talk about the scenario of the sales office and then we'll go into the, uh, yeah, but the lawyer, your review can come in. So when you go into a sales office, for example, and the sales office is a structure from which um, they're selling a pre-construction product. It could be from a Royal LePage office, for example, or it could be an actual site that was built by the developer to, to basically sell this product out of. I've, I've even seen these, um, sort of like uh, the portables that are sort of plopped on the on site and they add a couple of stairs to it and in you go and inside it's finished and they put up the uh, you know floor plans and the renderings and whatnot and they're signing chair and table that's all you need so what you walk in and in most cases they'll ask you to register yourself who are you we want to know who you are walking into our sales office so if you're going in with clients I mean, personally, I like to go and familiarize myself with the site before I bring my clients along. So I know if they ask me, oh, well, where is this building located? Even though the sales staff will explain that for you, but you want to kind of, as the person selling the product and collecting the 4% at the end, you want to know what it is that you're selling to your client. So try to familiarize yourself with that. But when you walk in with your clients, you want to register <coughs> your clients with that developer. So they say, oh, hi, I'm here with my clients and we want to see what you have. And they usually have a registration form that you can fill out by hand or they might have an iPad if they're very tech savvy and you can fill in the information of your clients. Make sure that they recognize that you are the representing party and you're, you're representing the buyers. You can hand them your business cards. Um, get to know the sales staff on site. Be nice to them because we're going to need them in the long run. Um, and then, you know, they're going to they take over. The site staff will take over and walk you through the project. Um, they'll tell you, okay, here's our model. Here, the building is this tall and, you know, we're going to have this many units and we're going to be um, located at, you know, at this cross section and um, we're going to have, you know, our prices start at whatever, and they'll hand a package to you, including the floor plans and the price list and whatnot, and they'll walk you through the product. And if you walk over here, this is a rendering of you know our amenities, and over here is a sample of what our bathrooms and our kitchen would look like. And um, you know they'll, they'll even tell you oh, everything you see here is standard, or you know this this drawer is an upgrade, or this island is an upgrade and whatnot. So they'll walk you through the entire thing. Once your client is basically satisfied with what they've seen and they narrow down their choices and they're actually ready to put pen to paper and sign a contract and that might happen that day or the next day um and if, if they want to come back a week from that day you still want to accompany your client because until the moment you that agreement is signed i want to be with my client to make sure that i'm the person uh, that they take down as the selling agent and i basically get my co-op agreement and I'm, I'm collecting my commission. So just accompany your client there. Um, what, if they um, want to sign and, and uh, are ready to purchase a unit, what they do is they have a worksheet. So that it's basically a, a, a form that um, asks for the name of your client, first name, last name, their date of birth, in most cases, their social insurance number, their email address is very important because nowadays, Terion is communicating with your clients only through email. So make sure you tell your client if this email address changes ever, as well as your phone number and your address, 
you want to inform the site in writing. They have to send an email. They can forward it to you. You can forward it to the site um, so that they can in turn inform their lawyers so that the lawyer can inform Terry on and that your client is basically getting all the communication through. So make sure that they're, if, if, because in, in, some, in most cases, this period from the moment they purchase until they become the owner could take, you know, four or five years sometimes. So it's possible that their address changes and whatnot to make sure that their the developer can communicate with your client. Uh, so you fill out that information, that worksheet, and you indicate what unit your client's interested in. Now, this is this scenario is when the sales office is open and it's not a launch of a product. I'll talk about launch because the launches are completely different. Um, so then the, the developer's representative says, okay, just give us a few minutes, we'll prepare the paperwork. They'll do the paperwork, so you're not typing up an offer for these units. In most cases, 99.9% .9 of the cases, you're writing this on the builder's agreement of purchase and sale, which happens to be um, about 40, 50 pages long, and um, they um, will. it will include um, basically a bunch of um, clauses and schedules that um, the tarion is part of uh, as well, and it will indicate... Um, uh, it will also include the floor plan of the unit, as well as a page that's called acknowledgement. Now, that acknowledgement page or disclosure of D, Schedule D, some in some cases, depending on how the agreement is set up for that developer, that page is where you want the date to indicate the time that when, at which you're picking up the copy of the agreement. If the acknowledgement, in, in most cases, the acknowledgement page is dated the same time your client signing it, that's fine as long as they're getting their copy that day. Make sure the date on the acknowledgement is reflecting the date at which you're picking up that copy of the agreement. Otherwise, your client might have lost a little bit of time. So um, they'll, they'll prepare the agreement. You sit down with uh, your client and the sales uh, staff um, on, on site, and they'll walk you through, okay, sign here, initial here, sign here, initial here. They'll do the whole thing. You just have to nod and say, yes, it's fine. You can just sign it. A lot of people are nervous about signing a 50-page agreement and want to read through it. It's going to take hours for someone to read through that agreement of purchase and sale unless they're a lawyer that is familiar with this basically uh, type of agreement. I really recommend you discourage your clients from reading the agreement on, at site, um, on site because you could be sitting there for a few hours as well as the fact that if they ask you any questions, we're not going to be able to explain the meaning of any of these clauses to them. So this is really good reading material for their lawyer. And this is a standard agreement. Believe you me, you're going to have an opportunity to have your lawyer review it. That's why they're giving us the 10 days. So just try to um, basically assure your client that it's fine and that they're not, um, you know, in this <coughs> stuff and they can't. There's, there's, way, there's a way out. They have their 10-day cooling off period and that's the reason that they have that so that the lawyer can review this paperwork. Um, Yes. Just a quick question. Do you know how much lawyers generally charge to review that document? Um, so they will charge a few hundred dollars, and that depends on lawyer to lawyer. Some, a, a lot of the lawyers will not charge your client anything at the time of reviewing, and given that you know they 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 are basically chosen to do the closing, and so everything will be charged at closing. If your client chooses to change lawyers, they might receive an invoice for a few hundred dollars for reviewing the paperwork. Yes, Hi, I have a question. You mentioned make sure to, to be with your clients at the time of registration. What if the clients were, you know, looking online and they registered online for something and then they call you and they said, oh, well, listen, we saw this, they registered already, can we go to Online is fine. You'll actually find that a lot of clients not unknowingly will walk into a sales office. Oh, we yeah. were just driving to the grocery store. We saw the site, we walked in. Make sure to educate them and let them know, listen, now that you're working with me, if you do happen to go to a site without me, have my business card on you or let them know that you're working with me and that I'm your agent. If I find out that my client has walked into a sales office, the first thing I'll do is I'll call them up. I'll call the sales office. As soon as I find out from my clients that they went to the site and they're interested, I understand my client was on their way to the, you know, to, to a wedding and they saw their sales office and they walked in. They're my clients. They're under, a, a, you know, a, 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 we're under contract. 
and um, I, I didn't know they're coming and make sure you visit that sales office at the first opportunity you have to give them your business card and have the site acknowledge that you're representing these buyers i'll be sure to accompany them moving fixed, forward basically if they sign up without you sorry it can be fixed if your plans yes are in, sign, in uh, most cases the developers are flexible when it comes to this because they understand that buyer agency agreement might exist and that you know the clients might I know we have had registered with the, directly with the developer mm -hmm. and many of them I mean I register mm -hmm. on all these sites as well and so the general public also does but um, if a lot of times you can't help it and so just communicate with the sales office and in most cases they're they're fine with that um what were we talking about so you're signing the agreement and that uh, agreement is done you your client um, has submitted their post-dated check, they get a copy of it or some sort of a receipt for these checks, then you're given this basically thick agreement of purchase and sale. In some cases, your, your client's signing more than one copy. Um, um, the One copy, two copies, I've even seen five, five copies because all the lawyers want original copies and whatnot, the developer wants an original copy, and they must give your client an original copy of the agreement of purchase and sale, and also a booklet. And this booklet is basically equivalent to what used to be called an estoppel certificate, and now it's called the um, uh, what's the book the what, the one that you get for condos status, status certificate. Thank you, uh, status certificate, and that's basically it's it, it equivalent of the same thing, but um, for brand new property. So this booklet, along with that agreement of sale, um, has to go to the lawyer right away. A lot of times, it, even though it takes them a a few hours to review it lawyers will take their time doing that and you want to have that extra time to in order to negotiate anything between the lawyers so make sure you get that to the develop to the to your client's lawyer as soon as possible be sure to pick a lawyer that is well versed in the world of pre-construction because not every real estate lawyer out there is familiar with pre-construction agreements and whatnot and a lot of times i find that they're di dissecting the agreement way too much and the deal falls apart in the interim so you know some clauses and some fees are standard and every de developer is charging it and the lawyer might try to negotiate that but that could basically mean that they're raising awareness to something that isn't negotiable and they're basically raising these red flags for your client and the client will get the nervous and then I'm, I want to walk away because my lawyer says this clause is whatever but you know as a matter of fact it might be a standard clause within the pre-construction industry. Do we have a question here? No. Okay. I, think that I, had a, I had a deal in, uh, about a year and a half ago with uh, pre-construction having kitchen blocking where the lawyer had no idea that the HST could be uh, relatable on closing and how. Yes. So the clients had almost lost two units on it. And That's so right. I regret them. We knew what he was doing. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yes. Do you know uh, some lawyers that you can recommend? Yes. We'll talk. Right. Send me an email afterwards, and I'll forward you something. Is the booklet really part of the package? Yes. Or? Well, yes, definitely. I went to one. They signed. They didn't give me a booklet. What is that? Did they give you a copy of the agreement? Yeah. Did they give you a USB that it contained that booklet? No. Okay. Talk to me afterwards. Um, okay, any more questions? Okay, so then this, this, these documents, and a lot of times the developer now is basically trying to be environmentally friendly and it does not provide um, a, a printed physical agreements. They're actually, your client signing on an iPad and they will electronically email a copy of the agreement and that booklet to you and your client, which is fantastic because then you can just quickly shoot that email to the uh, lawyer and have the lawyer review it. Freehold will not have a booklet, condo apartment. And that basically, that booklet, the disclosure booklet, will have an outline of what the maintenance fees will look like, what the maintenance fees are charged for, what the percentage of a maintenance fee is per unit. It actually lists all the units, what percentage according to the size of the unit, what's the maintenance fee on the parking spot, what's the maintenance fee on the locker. Space, how many parking spaces there are, how many visitors uh, parking spaces there are, uh, what's the reflected uh, sort of uh, maintenance um, or the management fee of the building, 
what is the reflected um, um, uh, um, reserve funds that they're expecting to have on the building. So all of that will be what what it, what are the rules and regulations surrounding um, the you know pets and whatnot. But you know not too uh, very detailed um, um, information because that all of that will come with when the management company takes over the site with. Uh, on, and that is when the building is registered, and I'll talk about what that is. So just hold on to that. Uh, so once the deal is signed, in um, in a lot of cases, the they will give you a copy of the co-op to sign on the spot as your client is signing, so that you are basically secured your commission. A lot of times, there I'm finding that the developers are holding that back because your clients have that 10-day cooling off period. And so they wait until the cooling off period or any extension thereof is finished and over um, and that they are received a mortgage pre-approval from you before they give you a copy of that co-op to sign. And that mortgage pre-approval um, as well as the lawyer review um, of the agreement is something that is very imperative within that 10 day cooling off period. So at the same time when your lawyer, your client's lawyer is reviewing the paperwork, you want to also talk to the bank or a mortgage broker in most cases is, is, is ideal and make sure that your client is approved and basically um, pre-approved for this purchase because the developers are now asking for that pre-approval letter before you would just pre-qualify them and say okay you have you know another four years before you have to close on this unit so let's not worry about it but the banks are becoming more and more um, particular about this and so the developer is asking for a very detailed mortgage pre-approval letter, um, which basically has to indicate that Mr. and Mrs. Smith are approved for an amount equivalent to this much, which represents about 80 to 75 percent of the purchase price, depending on how much down payment they're collecting from you. So if your client has to submit 25% deposit to the developer, they want the mortgage pre-approval amount not to be any less than 75%. It's okay if they're approved for more, but if they're approved for 65%, they're gonna come and say, we're missing a 10% here. Where's that 10% gonna be provided from? And if it's fine, your client might have extra money sitting in the bank, but that letter has to indicate they're approved for this much, which is equivalent to 65%, and they have savings equivalent to that extra 10% to cover the entire 75%. So the letter has to be that detailed. Um, and it has to indicate that this is a pre-approval for the purchase of unit 525 in such and such building. Yes. What about if they are using, instead of getting a mortgage, they're going to be using a, a home credit line? Then the, they have to get a letter from the bank indicating that the clients will have enough funds to cover this purchase for this amount. It has to be detailed. So they still need a letter. So in most cases, I find it's easier to just get a pre-approval. If they have that line of credit or, you know, they have enough savings or that there is, it's coming from the sale of their property, it might be just easier to provide a simple pre-approval letter as opposed to try and basically indicate in a letter that they're going to sell their home, then put that money in, you know what I mean? So just, they're going to be qualified as long as the bank's satisfied with that, then get a pre-approval letter. And so they are asking for that pre-approval. And then one of the reasons that they are very particular about this pre-approval letter is that when they go to their financing company for the uh, development and, and the building of this building, their financing companies are now being very picky about, okay, who are your buyers? Are they qualified buyers? So unless the building has qualified buyers and can show that all of my uh, purchasers are qualified for this purchase today, of course things change, and then they will not be able to get financing very easily. So that's the reason for that pre-approval letter. So regardless of the fact that if you're signing at the time of signing or later on after the 10-day cooling off period is done, once you've signed a copy of that pre uh, or the co-op agreement, what you want to do is that co-op agreement, again, has to be executed. There might be someone on site that can sign that for you. There might not be. What you want to do is ideally take a picture of that so that you have it for your record. Um, when they give you that signed copy of it and they might email it to you, and that's fine, make sure you get a, a photocopy of the front page of the agreement for your record so that you know what the name of the buyer was, what unit number your, uh, your client has purchased. And in most cases, the information of the buyer is printed at the bottom 
of that agreement of the first page of the agreement of purchase and sale. So their phone number, their date of birth, their SIN number, that's information that in the event you don't have the copy of a driver's license, you can fill out the FIN track easily using that information. Um, so get the copy, and, and in um, I believe our office requires that um, first page of the agreement as well when you're submitting your deal checklist as well. So that's something to, good to have for your record as well as to submit into the office. So once you've done that, your job is pretty much done. You no longer have to accompany your clients every weekend when they want to show their auntie and their uncle what, they're, what they've purchased because your client might end up going in every weekend literally for the first few months just because they're so excited about this purchase. You no longer have to accompany them. You're done. As long as their checks are clearing, you're not going to be basically contacted. Um, and so their checks will come out and if, uh, a couple of years down the road, when it's time for them to pick the colors um, of their unit, the color of the tile, the kind of the tablet and whatnot, they're going to be contacted by the developer. At that point, your client might call you, might not call you to accompany them. And that's totally up to you how much you, you know, I mean, personally, I would probably accompany my client because you never know you want to build continue building that relationship with your clients so it's okay to hold their hand and be there when they're choosing these colors and you know in the event you are responsible for selling that unit down the road you want to make sure they're choosing decent colors because then you're going to be left with like brown floors and black cabinets and it's going to be a tough sale so just accompany them and make sure that they're picking decent colors and neutral colors and modern colors that you know are are going to help them down the road and renting or selling the product eventually um, and that's pretty much it. So the way it's going to happen is um, a few years down the road, they're going to be called uh, to basically take occupancy of the unit. Occupancy of the unit is when the client is given a key and access to their unit and the unit is deemed livable. The building might not be finished. It's only going to be safe. Basically, the elevator is going to be functioning. There is going to be something that resembles a lobby. In most cases, the lobby is not finished at the time of color selection, at the time of occupancy. There will be, if the building provides that 24 hours concierge, there will be a concierge on site. Um, um, and that's about it. So the amenities are not done at this time. The um, floors usually above you are not completed. Your client will, um, in most cases, Basically, just they're lucky if they have carpeting in the, the level of their unit. That's about it. It's basically bare minimum, and their unit will have um, everything completed because they would have done their PDI. There has been these um, scary occasions where the client is given occupancy of a unit, in most cases, detached uh, freehold properties where uh, they didn't even have flushable toilets and whatnot. Um, so, you know, I mean, <coughs> When you have carry on, your clients uh, covered for these things, but um, and especially in condos, I don't see that very much. In detached properties and freehold properties is where I'm seeing that people are having a hard time with the developers getting them to deliver on what they promise. So um, the PDI is done prior to clients moving in, and that's called the pre-delivery inspection. It's done prior to your client moving in, and that would have been their opportunity to indicate any deficiencies. Oh, there's a scratch on the wall and the fridge is leaning and you know, there's um, this laminate floor is popping up a little bit. And maybe by if they're not um, sort of major deficiencies, they will still, your client will still have to take occupancy and the developer will schedule a time to come in and fix those deficiencies. Um, so your client gets the key to move into the unit at this time, if, if it was scheduled for them to pay an extra deposit of 5% at occupancy, they would have made sure through their client's lawyer that that money was collected, um, as well as they usually ask for 12 post-dated checks um, for the amount of maintenance fee as well as um, your occupancy fee. So maintenance fee is going to be basically your maintenance fee, which would have been uh, existing at, even if they were owner of the property. But this occupancy fee is a fee your client is paying towards the unit, which does not go towards their purchase price or their mortgage. Because at this point, when they're taking occupancy, they're not officially the owner of the unit. The deed is not in their name. The unit hasn't been registered to their name. The unit is still owned by the developer. And your client is, in a way, renting from the developer. And, sorry, yes. 
the maintenance fee that's coming out during occupancy, would it be lower lower rate than what would be normal because they don't have all the amenities and stuff available? They still pay oh, it. Okay. They don't they don't um, basically prorate it according to what is available. Whatever was the estimated uh, maintenance fee is what they're going to collect. And this occupancy fee is also referred to as a phantom mortgage because in most cases, it is the equivalent amount of what your client's mortgage would have been, uh, but they're only paying it as a rental fee to the lab, to the uh, uh, builder. Sorry. And this, um, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I lost you. That 5% that you pay on occupancy, is that check being given in the beginning when they sign or a, a lawyer will collect it? No, they, they, they don't collect the check for occupancy or even if there is a roof completion check at the time of signing because they don't know the exact date. So closer to that period, usually if, you know, if the builder's uh, considered enough, they might give your client a couple months notice, sometimes within a few weeks even, uh, and your client has to sort of be prepared. Even occupancy uh, could happen within you know, a very quick period of time. In a lot of the cases, they don't give your clients a very uh, long notice so that they pre prepare themselves. So your client has to sort of be aware of where the building is at because they will, in a lot of um, cases, they will inform you as well as your clients of the groundbreaking of the building and of the progress of uh, pre uh, of the construction. So they send, you know, just to communicate with clients. The developers send pictures, oh, we're halfway done, oh, you know, this is what the building is looking like now and whatnot. So you kind of are aware of what stage they're at, so you can anticipate that occupancy period, but um, in a lot of cases, they, you're not given a huge uh, notice. Um, the occupancy fee is, you said it's about, about a mortgage amount, including the maintenance or with maintenance on top? Of Ma that? Maintenance on top. Okay, and also, um, if you have a client with a lower level unit, because obviously they occupy like that. Yes. What's generally the time frame that they're going to be paying this fee? So um, an occupancy period could last anywhere between three months to, I've seen two years. Um, but that's not normal. I mean, about a year, year and a, a, a few months I've seen, but depends on the developer. If the developer is really good with their delivery period, and a lot of the builders that we work with, Pemberton Group, for example, try it out. Like these larger developers that are not so dependent on that financing period, on and on, and they in a lot of cases they have their own in-house uh, construction, basically uh, division and department. They're usually pretty good with their delivery time and their occupancy periods are not very large because at any given time, they have so many projects on the go. They just rather quickly do their occupancy and be done with it and not sit there. And they don't depend on that occupancy money. They just want to move on to the next project, next project. You will find that a lot of times it's the new developers and the smaller development companies that have that really extended period of occupancy. But, you know, I mean, it is regulated somewhat, but not a lot. Um, and, and the tarry on critical dates, that is part of the agreement, will outline what the maximum amount of, um, what the maximum amount of delay is that the developers allow. But that period is so long that, you know, the builders really protect it. Because if the builder doesn't deliver on certain dates that they've indicated, they actually have to pay the purchasers of these units a fine. So they will do whatever in their power not to have to pay the buyers um, a fine for delaying the project. At the same time, that period that they have, that window is so large that in most cases they don't reach it anyway. But so yeah, on, on average, the occupancy period is anywhere between, I usually tell everyone, three months to about a year, roughly speaking. And um, within that period, the rent checks are being collected by the builder. Um, and the building is still being completed. So there might be, there's no active construction. The building on the outside is completed. They're just finishing the unit on the inside. Um, and they're basically giving occupancy as they go up. And so people who've taken occupancy of the unit sooner are the ones that will close sooner. So they go according, the closings will come according to the occupancy schedule. In a lot of cases, you'll find that the developer uh, will be able to close on the unit that is higher up. So 
a lot of times you'll find that penthouse units will not have an occupancy period and that their occupancy and their final closing will fall at the same um, time frame. Um, and so they're basically closing and going in completely, um, um, basically without having to pay an occupancy. That happens rarely, it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen um, where their the occupancy period is completely, or if the buyer had bought later on basically, and the unit uh, was finished in the process before they bought it and uh, whatever the case might have been. So anyways, the, the occupancy period, um, however long it is, um, the, the, and the, the reason they have this occupancy period is that because the city does not allow the developer to register this condominium with, um, within their uh, departments until the building is about 80 to 90% occupied. And they have to uh, basically meet certain criteria. So the building's elevator has to be functioning, obviously the garbage chutes have to be functioning, um, the amenities have to be done to a certain uh, degree and whatnot, and that's when the building can, that can be uh, registered. And once they're registered, and that's when they start their closing. Um, yes? Can the unit be rented, or can they rent out for a client during the occupancy? So 99.9% .9 of the people who buy as an in investment uh, uh, will rent the unit within the occupancy period. Even though they're not the uh, legal owner? They're not the legal owner, but they have taken occupancy of the unit. You'll find that a lot of developers, their agreement of purchase and sale indicates that the client is not allowed to rent <clears throat> the unit within their occupancy period. It actually says that on the agreement. Pemberton is one of the builders that actually indicates that, and they will not waive on that whatsoever. However, 99.9% .9 of the buyers at Pemberton buildings rent within that occupancy period, and Pemberton just simply looks the other way. So, you know, I mean, in a lot of cases, they will allow it and they will just basically, they, they just don't want to allow it on paper just because there's li liabilities for them. Uh, but everyone rents. Yes. How they start closing from bottom of The same schedule that, as they took occupancy. So if I'm on second floor and I took occupancy in November and the, someone on the 10th floor took occupancy next year, February, then I will close first and then they will close later on. So if you are to rent a property that's just occupied now to take the possession of, who's the landlord? Your How client you, is. So you list even though they're not the legal owner of the property? Yes, yeah, so you, you'll find that, um, oh, absolutely, yes. Because they're, they're, they've taken occupancy and they're basically the intended owner of the unit. But the developer, if, some developers will actually go on MLS and call you up and say you're not allowed to put post this on, on MLS. And, Whatever Legally, the case are you allowed or not? If it says it on the agreement, you're not allowed. And there's HST implications for your client too. So if you're advising a client, be very careful because the HST implication is huge if they rent it out of the name and something goes wrong. A lot of times, the developers are asking you at the time of the worksheet uh, completion whether your client is an investor or an end user, and they have to report that now just because of the fact that you know all these HST issues were happening. Yes, go ahead. Have you ever had a case that, for example, the owner uh, moved in at occupancy time, right? But then those occupancy, uh, like the payment, the owner cannot uh, use a mortgage to pay, pay the owner has to pay himself, right? Yes. So if, if, let's say, if the builder delay and delay, it's supposed to be half a year, one year, and one and a half year, and then the, the, the individual, the owner is like, okay, wow, I'm, I'm paying over $1,000 every month, it's not from my mortgage, I'm, I'm getting it trouble with my finance and and then they when are they gonna ever close like like you said the window is so big so have you ever had a case that somebody's like well I'm I can't afford to continue to occupy here anymore and well even if they had a mortgage they would have had to pay the mortgage yeah. so that if it, even if there was a mortgage in place they would have been in trouble if they can't afford to pay the mortgage but that's a, a, a quite a legal procedure when it comes to these occupancy periods and they can't simply walk away because I can't afford it, they're still liable. But they, they can they argue, it's like, well, I didn't expect. If the developers. Is two years already. If, it, if it's within those critical dates indicated on the tarry on agreement, they can't argue it. It's indicated there. So as nothing that. this person can do. This no, can in, do. in most cases, no. It's just we can't part of the package. From the, from, the, from the occupancy? No. no. They're not the owner of the unit, so your their mortgage does not, they, they can't have a mortgage on a unit they don't own yet, right? 
this isn't registered. registered. They're just renting from the builder. The builder is still the registered owner of this condominium or the townhouse. And so once the occupancy period is done, your client will then be notified. Yes, sir. The client will be notified through their lawyer that on such and such date, you're going to be closing on the unit. And that's when your client then has to prepare to have their mortgage, um, basically um, uh, the mortgage um, paperwork ready and make sure that their mortgage is in place, make sure the lawyers um, basically informed of in case that it is communicated directly to them. In most cases, it's communicated to the lawyer anyways. Um, and just be ready for closing. They're going to ask for certain fees. Now, closing costs. So this is when their closing costs come into play. Closing costs are basically these um, levies and taxes and certain fees and such that have been passed on to your client by the developer. And these were all indicated in the agreement of purchase and sale as well as that disclosure booklet. And that's the period at which your lawyer would have negotiated these closing costs. In general, the closing costs could be approximately about 2% of the purchase price. Um, so sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more, but that's what you want to prepare your clients to be ready with that kind of money cash in their pocket. This is, does not come out of their mortgage. Right? If they have a line of credit they could use towards that, but that could affect their mortgage standing as well. So just be careful with that. Make sure that they're prepared and are aware that these closing costs will come. And the and basically the developer will pass all these fees to your client, whatever they can. Um, the fee that they pay for the installation of the um, hydro lines and all the basically um, uh, the, the connection fees for the hydro and electricity and what, all of that stuff is passed on to your client. Then they also will pass on to your client all their photocopying and all the admin fee that they pay to their lawyer, they will pass on to, their, to your client. They will also, there's of course the line transfer tax, there's the development charges and the levies. So that's usually the area where if a lawyer is, and if your client's lawyer knows what they're doing, that they're going to cap that. That's where the developer will be flexible and will allow a capping. And by capping, what I mean is, if you don't cap, they, they will say, okay, I will cap the development and levies at $2,500, $4,500, whatever the amount is that the developer is willing to cap it at. It means that on final closing, on the disclosure statement and on the basically uh, the, the outline of what the fees are, it will say development and levies, $4,500. It will not exceed that amount that they capped it at. If they capped it at $10,000, it will be $10,000, in most cases, not less. Um, but it will not go over that. So make sure that you know your lawyer, your uh, the client's lawyer is able to and um, knows what they're doing and is capping whatever it is that they can cap. Now these caps might be in, per, certain portions of the cap might be included as part of the incentives that we talked about originally. So it might be part of the incentive that the developer says, "I will do a capping of twenty five hundred dollars on the one bedroom unit." So it might be something that they will provide. But even within that development and levies clause. There are certain sections and each section will indicate a certain fee and so the law, even though they might have capped uh, section a and b of the development clause there is still sexual section e and f that the lawyer can ask for a further capping and so in some cases they do that yes sorry sure um you you mentioned that uh, the buyer has to inform the builder if they're going to use it's going to be the end user or they're going to rent uh, so if they say they're going to rent, they will have to pay HST, right? So that will basically come into play because a lot of things change. I might have indicated on my worksheet today that I'm going to be an end user, but in the interim, I get a job outside of the country and I actually will have to then rent the unit. At closing, the lawyer will, your client's lawyer will basically indicate further whether this is going to be a, a, a rental property or if it's going to be an end user property. So, you know, because things change. So regardless of what you put, I'm finding a lot of people are just putting end user on the worksheet now just because it's easier. Uh, but on registration, uh, your lawyer, your client's lawyer will ask if they're going to be end user. Okay, yeah, and, and if the person rents the property and gets charged the HST, if, if the client has an HST number, can they deduct the HST? That's a good question for the lawyer. 
Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's there's basically different criteria that apply. So it all depends. It all depends. Um, even as a as a, a rental property, someone might still qualify for an HST rebate. So it it will debate this. It, it will basically be, be different for each individual. So that's something that they can talk to the lawyer about and see what it is that they qualify for or not. So the huge cost for a developer in the beginning, if the development cost for education and levies and tax levies and all that, so they can break it down into the units and collect it at the Absolutely. end of closing? Yes. Lawyers make a lot of money. <laughs> no, not the lawyers. They I mean, and the developers. developers make a lot of money in the interim. That's why there's so many of them building uh -huh. nowadays. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made there. Yeah. Is there a cap on the HSD? <clears throat> I don't believe there's a cap on the HSD, but I'm not the best person to answer that question. I'm not going to. I think it's this. around 25000 That's why I was just looking for confirmation. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm sure we have lawyers that come in to at the academy and do courses on HSD on new uh, new construction and pre-construction, and they are the best persons to answer that question for you. I think there's still different. Right. Basically. Because going back to that scenario, I was telling you, this lawyer told me that a lot of people didn't know about it, and it's time time closing. He's like, well, I need another twenty three five for HSD, and they're like, uh, we don't have that. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, this is a good question for the lawyer. Okay. okay. Um, so um, they take occupant, they, they, they close on the unit and pay the extra closing costs and whatnot, and their mortgage is in place now, and they are officially the owner of this unit. If they had been living inside the unit during the occupancy period, then they, they continue to live in the unit. If they hadn't been and it was renting, you know, everything in, in terms of the uh, occupancy of the unit remains the same. Um, but they are now the legal owner of the property and their mortgage starts. Um, in some cases, um, the uh, during that period uh, where the occupancy is happening, the management companies might change, the maintenance fees might change. So within the first few years, that's where you see the biggest jump in the maintenance fee because the developers are keep trying to keep that maintenance fee low uh, at the time of marketing the product in order to entice people, oh, you know, this is something I can afford, it's something I can afford. But once the management company takes over, then they review the charges and all the costs for the building and the reserve fund and whatnot. And so they will, um, in a few years time, change the maintenance fees and divide it up by the number of units and everyone has to pay a higher uh, maintenance fee now to make up for the reserve fund and whatever deficiencies there might be. So an assignment, what is an assignment? Assignment? Yes. That's part of your closing cost. So every city and uh, township has a certain um, <clears throat> amount that's called educational charges that is reflected and passed on to the builder as part of the closing costs um, and for occupies buying this space basically and being an owner. And many of us basically pay that as part of our property taxes anyways. So it's reflected to the developer and the developer will pass it on to your buyers. Um, uh, so the assignment. Assignment is when your client has made a purchase of uh, a purchase at a new construction site and they have this agreement of purchase and sale. The building might not even be built yet um, or it might be built but they haven't taken occupancy. Oh, in some cases they have taken occupancy already but they decide to basically not close on the unit. They decide, okay, I can no longer afford this unit. I, I don't know if I can um, live in it or, you know, my, my circumstances have changed for whatever reason I want out of this deal. And so they choose to sell the unit. And when they're selling this, now they're selling the agreement of purchase and sale. They're not actually selling a unit because this unit does not exist. And so that's called an assignment agreement where the client is selling their right to this unit. Um, in a lot of cases, the developer will cooperate. And you basically, your clients will have to ask permission um, to assign a unit. So their lawyer will contact the developer's lawyer and says, my client would like to assign their unit. The, depending on where the building is, what stage their sales are at, because every builder will have their own criteria in order to allow this assignment to take place. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, if they if the site is sold out or that particular model is sold out, they might be a little bit more open to the idea. If the building is 
you know, if, if their financing is in place, they are probably more um, inclined to allow assignments. So whatever their rules and regulations are, if your client meets those criteria, then they will allow in writing um, for your client to assign their unit. But they will, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, indicate you are not allowed to list this on MLS. So it has to be an exclusive listing agreement that you do for your client and that you can advertise it on sites um, that we have, Broker Bay, as well as our Facebook pages, as well as our Habs Wants. You know, those are areas where you could advertise it potentially. And it just has to be by word of mouth, really. You can, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, people post them on Kijiji and Craigslist as well. So because you can't put it on MLS. Um, so once you've basically advertised it and you find a buyer, your buyer, um, and, and the way you come up with this price, and I mean, this could be a whole course on its own, but I'll quickly go into um, the details. The way you come up with a price for this assignment is whatever your client paid at the time they purchased. Um, you want to take into consideration what the unit is uh, worth today. So if there are still units remaining at the developer's site, that would be a good indication of how much the prices have gone up because they go according to the market as well. Um, or basically potential competition sites that are offering units similar to this. That could be a good indicator of what the property is worth. A, a lot of times people will basically look into the resale market to see what today's market value is for this property if they were to um, uh, sell it. And so you want to basically add, make sure to add your commission on top of that and the commission to cooperating agent. And the uh, difference in amount will then be the um, amount of money your client is making in the interim. So in most cases, we all know these properties grow in value. By the time they become the owner of it, there's already a lot of equity built in that property. And so this buyer is wanting to walk away with that built e equity now. And so you'll uh, once you get an offer or an agreement, you, you want to basically negotiate an agreement on behalf of your client. That is when you indicate where, how much this basically uh, unit has grown, and how much money they're going to make on top of the purchase price that they paid, as well as the fact where this money is going. Is it going to be held in trust until final closing and then released to your buyer or is a percentage released to the buyer now and then a, another percentage? So these are all terms that can be negotiated throughout the agreement. Obviously, uh, your buyer would want to take as much money as they can now and walk away with it. But keep in mind, even if that is the case, your clients is going to be liable until final close, until this new purchaser has completely fulfilled their obligation with the developer and have closed on the unit. If at any time they don't close on the unit, your client is still on the hook. And a lawyer is, is a great person to get involved with very early on with an assignment just because there's a lot of details and a lot of um, basically little loopholes that you want to be comfortable with. And so get a lawyer on board right away when you're doing assignments. Any questions? Yes. Maybe an inadequate question, but if the new buyer of the assignment sale gets uh, possession on closing when the building is registered, who gets to use the property during the occupancy period? So your client's assigned already? Yeah, let's say my client is the original buyer who bought pre-construction. Yes. And now he sold the property as an assignment sale to a new buyer. Yeah, so then, the new buyer gets then, occupancy. Okay, the new buyer gets occupancy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So your client's going to be the assignor and they're going to be the assignee. So the assignee is going to be the person who get, takes occupancy. They're responsible for paying that 5% on occupancy if it was scheduled, for example. But all those terms can be negotiated on the agreement. But they take occupancy and they're paying occupancy period if they want to move in or rent it. They're the one who, who's doing it. But the builder is in touch with the original buyer. Not no, no. So if, that's why you want the developer on board with the assignment because once this assignment, once your client and the new client, the, the new buyer come to an agreement, then your client's uh, lawyer will communicate to, to the developer's lawyer that okay, my client has assigned their right, and this is the name of the new purchaser, and the new purchaser will, in most cases, will need to be pre-qualified by the buyer uh, by the developer as well, and. Some, in some cases, they might ask for mortgage pre-approval by the new buyer as well. So the lawyers of the developer are very much involved in the process of the assignment and are aware of who the new buyer is. And the lawyer, the, my client's lawyer, who 
who he was dealing in with the pre-construction basically is an ex his experience in dealing with pre-construction he would, would know what to do right <laughs> what one would hope okay yeah in most cases they are did yeah. you comment on the assignment fees i missed that if you did assignment fee on yeah the how much is it usually? How does it work? In, in some cases, the um, developer might also not allow assignments. Right. So if the developer does not allow assignments, and you know that's the case closed, you can't do anything about it. If they do allow assignments, they in most cases they there will be a fee. Developer wants a piece of this pie that your client is basically walking away with. Okay, why should so and so be entitled to make thousands of dollars on a product that I sold? You know, tw five years ago, I want a piece of the pie. So a lot of I'm, I'm a lot of developers charge a five thousand dollar fee. A five thousand is pretty much industry standard, and um, and get to people inter interested and excited. There's going to be signage and hoardings on on site. They're going to, in most cases, do advertising on the radio, television, depending on how much money they want to uh, invest to get people excited. Uh, what will happen is the first um, um, the first opportunity where people will be able to get their hands on these floor plans and price lists is at the builder's friends and family event. So what the builder will do is, in some cases, open their doors to their own friends and family, as well as to their past buyers in some cases. So if they bought previously from Pemberton, Pemberton might call them and say, okay, you know, on February 25th, we're having our friends and family event. As a past purchaser, we consider you family. Come on in, you will have an opportunity to buy. And so your client might be able, might be contacted, even though you brought them into the previous product, uh, they might be contacted directly by the developer to go in and buy directly now, and you will not be entitled to commission of this event. At friends and family, the developers don't pay commission. Then what will happen shortly after the friends and family they are going to have their platinum launch and every developer has their own lingo for a platinum round they'll call it the elite you know builder uh, elite agents launch or the golden circle or vip even some call it but that's basically the first opportunity where realtors are allowed in and the builder will pay commission on this uh sale and that is usually extended to um, agents that have previously worked with this builder and have sold their products and have performed well. So, for example, because I've worked with Pemberton, I know that if you sell five units with Pemberton in one year, you're automatically considered a platinum agent, so you get invited to their next platinum launch. Yes. Does the price of a unit differ from friends and yes. family? Oh. Yes. So, in some cases, yes. It all depends on how much. So, these prices change instantaneously. So, we did friends and family for Pemberton, uh, at Indigo when we launched the project. And it was a good turnout, but it wasn't fantastic. So we moved some units and we decided, okay, maybe it's not a good idea to increase the prices from family and friends to platinum. But in some cases, if there's hundreds of people that show up to friends and family and, and the developer is like, okay, maybe my prices are a little bit low, let's increase them for platinum. So, you know, yes and no, it all depends on, on the project. Yes. My my girlfriend just went to a friends and family for an Elgin Mills and Baby for a while. Yes. They were offering 5% rebate on the existing purchase. Yes. So what the what the developers will do is they the incentives they will offer at friends and family are different than the incentives they offer at Platinum. Because they're not paying commission they are able to offer a cash back credit on closing. If you buy today, I will credit your purchase $18,000, $25,000, because I'm not paying 4% commission, so I can afford to do that. Um, but once they, they launch to Platinum, that cash back incentive is taken away now because they're paying a percentage commission, but they might keep the incentive, the other will parking locker might still be included, they might still offer free assignment. And that free assignment, just keep in mind, if you do see free assignment being offered as an incentive, your client might still be required to pay the lawyer's fees. So, so there might be a few hundred dollars of fees that's still involved. So just prepare your clients for that, with that. And the, it really is the job of the lawyer to do that. 
So unless you know for a fact that there's a fee, maybe don't talk about it, but ask the site agent. So just so you know, um, I, I know it's zero assignment, but is there a fee that's involved? Is, is my client going to be liable for the lawyer's fees and whatnot? And they can, in most cases, tell you. Um, um, so they will change the incentives a little bit at Platinum or VIP launch. Um, the prices might be reflected as well. I mean, in some cases, if the product is moving really well, we will increase the, or the developers will increase the price of the unit on the spot. So we had, in one instance, we had one or two more of a particular model left and we got a worksheet in and we called them up and said, okay, the price has just gone up $12,000. And the developers do that, $17,000, even within the platinum launch. And is your client still interested, take it or leave it type thing. And in most cases, people will take it just because I want to get in. This is the unit that I want. And so developers are able to do that. Um, so once that round is exhausted and they usually that round usually lasts uh, about two weeks just because they want to wait for that 10 day cooling off period to be done. And the event that people cancel those units, they know what kind of inventory they're looking at. Then they'll launch to the general realtor population if there is any units left, that is. And they've launched the general realtor population. At that stage, your um, the availability is a lot less. You know, the building might be 50% sold by this stage, if not completely sold out. The prices will definitely go up at that stage. Um, and the incentives might change. So at this point, they might say, we're no longer offering pre-locker. Um, and that if you, you, know, you're, you want a locker, it's now $7,000. Or the cappings might be different. The free assignments might be taken away. So the incentives are different. Um, usually the commission amount stays the same. Um, and once they've exhausted that round, which again will last about two weeks just to count the 10 day cooling off period, then they will launch to the general public. So if your client had gone to their website and registered directly to basically have first dibs on the, on the project, they might not be getting in until, you know, way down the road. And that's where our value as realtor uh, realtors come in. You have to educate your clients that, you know, yes, you are a registrant with the builder, but the builders in most cases cooperate with, with agents and brokers are protected. So they will work with me before they work with you. So the number of individuals that would knock on the sales office door saying, I registered on the builder's website. I don't understand. You guys are selling half time. I can't get in. I'm sorry, you can't come in unless you have a realtor and your realtor is a platinum agent, right? So you, you, they just have to realize that just because they're a registrant doesn't mean they're going to have first day. So by the time registering launch comes out, which is basically the public release of this product, the price would have gone up three, four times at least. The availability will be scarce. That's if the developer chooses to hold back some units for the public launch and that there's any inventory left. Um, the incentives will change in most cases. Um, at that stage, you could still walk in with your client um, and earn commission if this is your, your buyer at the registrant's launch, but um, you want to get in as, as basically early as possible because that's where the most amount of money is to be made. Um, however, it's not always easy to get in just because when this builder sends out, sends out these basically blurbs and whatnot, soon after when they are you know, offering this building at, to the platinum um, realtors and the platinum launches, there are thousands and thousands of agents that are sending in worksheets. Yes, there might only, depending on the size of the building, of course, a developer might choose to have only 20 platinum realtors or 150 platinum realtors. In one case, we did the Icona launch. I don't know if any of you remember that. That was a couple of years ago, October-ish. They're at the Platinum launch. They held it at the um, Hilton Garden Inn Hotel at Jane and Highway 7. I would say easily there were about four or 500 people at the Platinum launch, just because there were um, five towers to be uh, sold and there were thousands of units. And so they wanted to create this huge hype. And so they let in every agent possible and they said, oh, you're platinum, come on in, come on in. And so they received 6,000 worksheets within the first week. Um, with the, um, one second, with the One Young, for example, launch, which they, you know, the buzz has been going for months and months now. Um, I, my understanding is, and you know, yes, they might be exaggerating a bit, but you know, there's 
usually they're not too far off. They received 3,000 worksheets within the first uh, week even. Yes, go ahead. Is some of these rules apply to pre-patched homes or not? If the developer is cooperating, in most cases I find detached properties, they don't cooperate with realtors. Um, if they do, then, you know, depending on the number of units they have, yes or no. This is, um, it, it, it's mostly with a condominium launch is that you'll find this. With the detached properties or the townhouses, you'll find there, they'll say, okay, you know what, we're launching on such and such, they come and line up. And people line up, they sleep overnight, you know, they camp out. And, and we did that at some of the condo uh, sites, we even would camp out. I remember 10 years ago when um, number um, one Bloor East was uh, released, um, I myself with a colleague of mine had someone sleep in line for us five days um, in order to basically be number or whatever in the lineup in order to get in because back then it was like first come first serve and we basically provided food and 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 um, uh, we would one of us would stand in so he this person could run to the bathroom and do their stuff but this person was paid to sit in line for us uh, for five days so so that we could get in. So, you know, it used to happen like that and some developers still like to do it that way, but in most cases we're finding that they're doing the platinum launches and whatnot. Yes. When I go on the Buzz Buzz site for new development, up in the corner there's always somebody from Red Pin. Does that mean that they're the platinum agent? Or? So, um, Red Pin um, basically is a company that came in and um, tried to make a website similar to Buzz Buzz Homes. It was to an extent um, successful, but not as successful as Buzz Buzz Homes. And I'm finding that these the sites are basically higher, are basically uh, collecting money from realtors to be advertised on their pages. So we, I might go on on a product um, page on Buzz Buzz Homes or Condo Now um, and see that so and so is a platinum agent. They might not necessarily be a platinum agent, and you'll find that. The reason why I say they're receiving thousands of worksheets is not because their platinum agents out there are basically bringing out in all these worksheets. They're selling these their allocations, so they're selling their rights and they're collecting um, worksheets from me who might not be a, a platinum agent. If I have an in with a developer, I will advertise it to my network of realtors and say, "Oh, by the way, if you want to get in on, into whatever building, I have access." So this basically individual who does not have platinum access will go through me and I will collect a percentage of the commission, or basically keep back a percentage of commission because I have access to the building but that next individual does not have. So that person up on that ad on Buzz Maybe, may not maybe have. not. It's hard to know. Um, so um, in order to get in, sorry, yeah. So a quick question. When we're talking about platinum releases and all that, when we're getting the emails from the office, does that mean it's at the platinum stage? So in most cases, I will explain in the body where uh, what the procedure is. So uh, I, I've been sending out, in case some of you haven't been receiving it, please check your junk mail. <coughs> um, E-blasts are going out almost on a daily basis with, um, with new development or information or reminders. And the subject will more or less tell you what it is. So I sent one for one young, for example, and the sender in, in all cases will be pre-construction department. Um, and it will say, so I sent one for one young last week and it said the long awaited one young is now here. Uh, send in your worksheet. So just read the instructions there. And uh, once you log in, has everyone been able to get into the pre-construction website? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you log into the pre-construction website and click on that link and choose the thumbnail that you want to work with, it brings you to my Google Drive. In the Google Drive, usually what I will do is include the procedure of the worksheets, right? So where it says worksheet, there's usually a procedure included, and it will tell you, okay, worksheets are accepted immediately, um, and allocations are given to worksheets submitted. So some developers might give us allocations and say, okay, these 10 units are, are yours to sell, and then I might advertise that and say, okay, you know what, we have these units, and it's going to be a first come first serve basis send in your worksheets um, or they might say okay we're going to allocate according to the worksheet submitted and i will indicate that in the agreement 
or in the email so that we have to submit worksheets in order for the worksheets to get allocations. Yeah. So the day before we sent that email, I received another email from an agent who had uh, platinum, I guess, access. So in his little blurb, it said, you know, download worksheet here, download through events here, download price list here. And I thought that was great advertisement to send out. How do we do something like that? Or am I far Let's talk afterwards about that. Okay. Um, so just keep in mind what you, I'll outline the procedure. If at any point you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, the um, All the information that I'm putting on the website, you are able to download and use on your web pages, on your e blast on um, your flyers, with the exception of the price list. So when we're <clears throat> when the developers within the platinum round, they absolutely do not want the price list published out there. So make sure you don't publish it on your Instagram or anywhere. Um, and they will call, they will basically, they have a team of people that will sit there religiously looking through all these websites and Instagram pages and Facebook pages, just looking for anyone who might have leaked too much information. So you want to make sure to respect that so not to jeopardize our platinum standing or our standing with the developers. But feel free to advertise the project. So use the renderings that they've provided. Use the logo that they've provided. You can talk about the deposit structure. You can even say prices starting from, right? So you can indicate that. But don't post uh, the price list anywhere. Some of them might even be particular about the floor plans being posted. But it will indicate that. I'll, I'll basically write it. I think there was one email I sent um, and I made it a note saying, please do not publish the price list and the floor plan. So if that's the case, I'll indicate that for you. Uh, yes. So only the price list? Or usually, usually. Because yesterday I checked the, the latest project of Trident and uh, it's wrote on their web, uh, website that if you wanted to advertise this project, yeah, their original logo. It depends from builder to builder, it's different, but generally speaking, they don't want within the platinum. Tridel works differently, they have their own set of rules and regulations. Uh, but majority of the developers out there within the platinum launch, they do not want that priceless printed just because they want to keep it exclusive to their platinum agents, they want to make it as mysterious enough, as hard to reach as possible. That's why you'll find a lot of cases within the Platinum Launch, they will not post their phone number of the sales office anywhere. You know, I mean, I could go crazy trying to locate a phone number for a sales <coughs> office, but they absolutely, first of all, they're going to be super busy and they won't answer any phone calls, but they won't publish just because they want to create that hype and that, you know, sort of like it's going to be a hard to reach project. So feel free to use the material as, as much as you need to, to post it on your website, on your flyers. And in most cases, I understand it's a timing thing because when the, uh, when the platinum round comes around, they will let me know yesterday and they want worksheets today. So you might not have that much time. That's why we try and these developers kind of reach out to us ahead of time. So with regards to One Young, for example, a blurb had gone out from me back in November with a little bit of a basic information about one young and that would have been basically your opportunity first opportunity to know about the project and maybe start talking about it on your social media within your circle of clients and network of friends um, and maybe advertise it on your website and uh, have a landing page and we can talk about what that means um, your web developer will know really well what these landing pages are and you want to basically continue advertising that to your database of clients. You'd be surprised how many people might not necessarily associate you to a pre-construction site and might think, oh, I didn't even know. You might have sold them their home. They don't even know that you do have access to uh, pre-construction as well. And that is a part of your business also. So make sure you communicate that um, to them directly. And you know, when you make your phone calls, hi, Mr. So-and-so, I haven't talked to you in a bit. But I wanted to let you know there's this project coming up. I thought now that you've built a little bit of equity, maybe this is a good time to, you know, use that. Have you ever thought of investing in? You know, I mean, you want to build that relationship and continue that relationship and let them know that you are in the pre-construction industry. Post it uh, wherever you can post it. You'd be surprised. There's 
the resources at our fingertips that we might take for granted. LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and your circle of friends. Yes, sir. Just going back to the unique to Panem, if, if I have access to a property or units at the Panem level, would I reach out to you so you can let others know? Or so the, I'm finding a lot of real trick. So but what will happen is Royal LePage, um, your community and connect, we will have our own access to some sites, but not all the sites. And many of you might have a relationship already with a developer. So you might have worked with Tridel, for example, and you might have an in with them and your platinum with them. So as it stands, I, the pre-construction department is not advertising for any individuals just because it would be, if I do it for one person, I'll have to do it for everybody and it's impossible. Well, with 1,400 realtors, everyone will have an access somewhere. But you are able to post it on the haves ones, you can post it um, on the broker's base site, and maybe even so, I've seen some, some of our realtors do flyers around their offices or just word of, put it on, on the door of your office and let people know that you do have access. So that's something I have to visit and I have to talk to Vivian about and see how much we can then average. If I absolutely have no access to a project, then we might pick and choose. But as, as it stands, we're not advertising for any individual agent within the office. Yeah. Yes. I, I have this general impression that it's very hard to find units. So like if we're looking at this an allocation, like you gave the example of 10 units. Yeah. I'm thinking again, like 1,400 agents, what are the chances that I'm going to be able to get a unit for a client who might be able so to advertise in advance? It's, like it's, it, it is very tough. So you want to prepare your clients for the fact that they might not get in within the platinum round. Um, what will happen is, like I said, um, there's gonna be thousands and thousands of worksheets and these developers then pick and choose their favorites, of course, and depending on who's sending in. So timing is very important. Um, if a client, you know for a fact, my client wants to get in at one young, you wanna educate them and let them know, listen, don't be picky with your choice of units. I find time and time again, agents talk, sit there for hours reviewing these floor plans with their buyers. Oh, this one, the bathroom is two inches shorter than that other one, maybe we should. Don't be too picky. If you just want to get in, if your client just wants a unit there and they want it badly enough, they need to be very flexible with the floor plans. They need to be very floor, uh, flexible with the level that the unit is being offered to them and give as many choices as possible. Um, even if, if the worksheet gives you three choices, I sometimes would even write choice number four, choice number five, choice, just give the sales office options so that it's hard for them to reject your worksheet. Because if you put in um, your choice of unit, unit uh, floor plan A on floor five and floor six and floor seven, and that these are my only choices, they're gonna basically throw your worksheet out because they want to have flexibility with your worksheet. So to educate your clients, make sure that they understand they might not get their first choice in many cases of unit and indicate as many um, um, options as possible. Make sure the worksheet is as complete as possible. If the information is not legible, they're going to toss the worksheet. If the information is missing, if um, uh, email addresses, phone numbers are missing, they're going to toss the worksheet. So make it as legible as possible, make, give them as many choices as possible, and prepare your clients. Let them know, listen, it's the first round, this is a very popular building, we might not be able to get it, I'll do my very best to get you a unit. And in some cases, I will put you in touch with an agent that might still have units. If my allocations run out and I'm not able to fulfill your worksheet, then I will say, okay, but Mr. So-and-so, has allocations that they're still selling. If you want to work with them, they will hold back 1% of the commission, but you know, you're know you still delivering to your client so that your client knows next time around, if he, they want a unit, they will come to you as opposed to go to the Google searches. And just the minute they put in the name of the building, thousands of agents will come up as in the search engines as platinum realtors mm -hmm. and VIP realtors. and. A lot of times our clients might think this is the builder site and mistakenly register to, oh, I'm registering at the builder site, site, but then they get contacted by a realtor out there and they say, okay, I have info session, floor plans will be shared and it's going to be, so at the Icona launch, the uh, agents that knew that this was coming booked their meeting rooms in that 
hotel room where the builder was holding the event, people thought they're attending the builder's event. Even realtors like us thought they're attending the builder's event. Once they went in, way down the road, they realized, oh no, this is an outside broker who has access to the building. And now I have to, I'm have i not making any money now. I'm not talking to the developer and they're gonna hold the commission. And so if your client registers with them that, they're gonna argue saying, well, your client registered on my site, then it's intended basically relationship and whatnot. So you might be basically out of commission. So be careful with those things, educate your clients as much as possible. And if you have to give up, I know um, one of our realtors had to give up at Icona, the total commission was 4%. I think she even took units at 0.5% commission and gave away three and a half percent commission just because she wanted to deliver to her clients and for her clients to know that she's the go-to person. So, you know, just basically weigh your um, options. Do I want to deliver to my clients and be the go-to person and make 0.5% commission, you know, and, and that doesn't happen very often. Uh, or do I want to tell them, I'm sorry, couldn't help you, um, and they'll go through someone else. So that might be an option to do. Um, we could obviously talk about this for hours and hours, but um, so, so what you want to do in, to educate yourself and, and learn the ins and outs is go to the sales offices that are open. And then find out basically how they operate. Learn the different builders' websites. Go on every website that you can possibly get onto and register as a, these builders' websites. Go to Mankey's, go to Pemberton, go to um, um, Tridel. All the builders out there, try to register on their websites as someone who's interested to receive product, and then they'll communicate with you. Follow them on Instagram, follow them on Facebook, so that you're in the know and know when product is coming out, what kind of product is coming out. And then visit their sales offices. Um, these are some of the, so our website, as well as the e-blasts I send out are important, but I can't possibly cover the entire GTA. There's just so much that pops up on a daily basis. And so these websites, Buzz Buzz Homes and Condo Now, are a fantastic resource where if you can't find something on our website, then go to their website, Google search the product. Often you'll find there's articles that are printed in the um, Globe and Mail and the store about this project that might have been printed a couple of years ago and they'll give you some inside information about the bit size of the project, what kind of um, sort of um, units you're looking at. In some cases, they might even indicate pricing. <coughs> can I just quickly run yeah. through this and then we can talk after because we have another meeting right after. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this development and planning application website, um, that's only for the city of Toronto. But every city, their website will have um, a, a section where people, uh, all these builders that apply for an application and put in an application for a permit on a site, will these uh, applications get registered on the city's website. And that application will then indicate what kind of property is coming where way before any sort of advertising or marketing is done on that site. So if you know for a fact that you want to market and basically advertise and work at the corner of Young and Finch, for example, and you want to stay on top of any upcoming development in the future, then that's where you want to go because it will show you what is an app, you know, the applications that have been posted for that corner way before anything, any sort of information, it, even before they pick a site name, a marketing name for that site, the applications will be there. So that's a great site. And it, in most uh, most of the city websites, will you will find that section. So that's a great resource. And the magazines and the Facebooks and, you know, there's just so much information out there. So don't, I, I've been to some of the Connect offices and we've talked about this, but one really valuable uh, way of making it in with a developer is not to do it through the VIP and the Platinum launch. Because in most cases, your name is not being recognized amongst the thousands of agents. And especially if you're going through, you know, my our connection, the YCR connection, the worksheets are going in under Vivian VCT. So they might not know you individually. But in order to build a relationship with a developer, what you want to do is go to their sites that still have remaining inventory. 
all these sites that have been so hot and you're hearing about, oh, they sold out within the first week or whatever, I promise you in most cases, they do not sell out. They still have some remaining inventory because people will cancel. They might have allocated all the units and they might have signed all the units, but many people will cancel the deal. So they might have in remaining inventory. The, I don't know if any of you recall, but Social was launched not too long ago. Panda was launched not too long ago. And these were all you, uh, buildings that we couldn't get. Or, uh, our worksheets did not get allocation. Maybe a, a fraction of our worksheets got allocations just because of the demand that there was. But they're emailing me on a daily basis with their remaining inventory. So don't dismiss that opportunity. If your client is an end user and really wanted to get into the building, there's still value there. They're still, yes, the prices have gone up and it might be hard for someone to swallow that pill. But from now when they buy until five years from now when they close, there is still going to be a growth in that in the value of the property. Um, so what, what I recommend to a lot of people is go to the website and go to the site, um, the, the agent site or the builder site where they still have remaining inventory. Get to know the developer and their product. And if the inventory is something that's marketable, then tell the site um, agents you want to do an event at their site. And this event doesn't have to be anything elaborate. It could just be over a weekend where you're sending out flyers and you might serve refreshments. You might not. A lot of the times I'm finding they're not even serving refreshments. So one um, example was a site where we were at about 75% sold. Uh, a couple of agents walked in. From, they weren't on our platinum list. They walked in, they wanted to know if we had any inventory, they liked the product, and they asked if they could add, do an advertisement and hold an event over a weekend. The developer is more than happy to get free advertising, of course. So they sent an email, we said, okay, can you request it in writing? They sent an email to us saying, you know, Joe Smith wants to do an event on uh, Friday, on Saturday and Sunday, February 4th and 5th. And the developer, we forward that to the developer. The developer said, okay, yes, no problem. They can do an event. So the name is, you know, basically um, the name is introduced. The name of that realtor for the first time is introduced to the developer. They held an event. They sent out flyers where on the flyer they advertised where with every firm sale, you're going to receive an iPad. They're making 4% commission. iPad costs, what, 1200 bucks, right? Um, so they were offering free uh, iPad. The number of people that walked into the sales office saying, I'm here to receive my iPad. Even our purchasers, the people that have bought, came in saying, oh, the builder's giving out an iPad now? I'm like, no, 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 it's not a builder. It's, it's an outside agent that's doing that. So a lot of people showed up that weekend for this agent's um, um, event, and they ended up selling 25 units at a dormant site where we were sitting on 25% um, uh, product. And so every time there was a sale that was happening, every night basically we send a report to the developer and the name of that agent was recorded as the selling agent. So not only did they make 4% commission on 25 units over a weekend, they also were then invited to the platinum launch of the next project this builder launched. So it's don't dismiss the sites that have inventory. Go, it's it's a perfect opportunity to learn the ropes and not be bombarded by a number of uh, other agents that you have to compete with. It's your opportunity to get in, and there's money to be made there. Okay. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> Everything in a nutshell. Uh, but um, I, there's going to be follow-up courses that I'm going to do. Because there's just so much that can potentially be covered. Um, and you know, you're all I, I basically ask you to all reach out to me if you want to sit down with me on a one to one basis. I'm happy to do that. If there's any particular questions you have specifically about any project, I'm happy to answer them. And when I send out those e blasts, if there's any gray areas for you, if you're confused about anything, feel free to reach out to me. I'm just an email away in most cases, phone call away, email best, but um, but um, just reach out to me. Will there be a course on marketing and how to? We're going to build on that. Oh, definitely. 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 There's, there's no basically holy grail of making it in, in, in this industry. What might work for you might not necessarily right. work for someone else. But, but at least but, the idea of how to put everything together and send it off. And absolutely. Absolutely. And your web developer is a fantastic source for, for that because they're getting basically approached by a lot of realtors like yourself 
who want to know how do I get this product out. I'm providing you the product. Right. I might not be necessarily the best person to show you how to advertise it because marketing is not my basically forte, but someone who is well versed in the marketing world will be able to tell you how to do that best. Yeah. I'm going to bring business cards up and I'll hand out my business cards to everybody. So if we go to condo now mm -hmm. and we see a site that we want, how do I find out if we're involved with that? Go to our pre-construction website. Okay, and if we're not, then it's, I just got and to then just, myself. So you can reach out to me and say I want, I'm interested in this uh, particular product, but if I have a connection to get you in, okay. then I will make that connection okay. for you. All right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Can you just briefly explain the, the worksheet? Like how does the worksheet work? So depending on what stage of the project and the launch there it is, the worksheet, if, if it's just being launched now, um, and I send you an e-blast saying worksheets accepted now, that worksheet is going to be one of the links that's going to be accessible through our website. And what you have to do is fill out the worksheet with the name of your buyer, um, their contact information, email, address, SIN number, and all of that. Um, as well as attach a copy of their ID. Make sure the ID is the one you photocopy it, it's not too dark. And include your name on top of it. And you, if I ask you to email it to ycrcondos at gmail.com, then you send it to ycrcondos. If it says, the instruction says, go to the builder's website directly and register, then that's what you do. But if you're going to a site that has remaining inventory, they will simply hand you a worksheet and you fill it out on the site. And that, on that worksheet, that's where you indicate what kind of units your clients are interested in. That's where they show you the options of, um, I want unit 1A and 1B and 1C and whatever. When you say go to the site, do you mean? Uh, Not their website, the actual oh, sales office, okay. if they're allowed, if, if the site is basically if they're past the platinum and the VIP and they're open to public now, right. you can actually walk in with your buyers. Okay. Uh, but if it's within the opening, basically, um, round of platinum and VIP and whatnot, then you might not be able to go to the sales office, but you will basically go according to the instructions that I provide for worksheets. Thanks. Yes. Um, just a quick one. Um, if I want to find out a certain builder, how good they are in terms of um, whether they have any whether there's financial problem and is there a site that we can go check? Um, there, there are some sites, but not all the builders are registered on these websites. Um, the first thing I usually do is just Google search a builder. Um, um, and there's usually articles and whatnot that you'll find about a developer. There was one particular developer that had past projects that had failed. And the minute I Google them, it popped up. Everything popped up. Um, if you don't find anything particular on, on them, then you can sort of ask the people, reach out to me if I know the developer, I'll be happy to basically. I think there's also Build, if I'm not mistaken, but Build does not have all the developers listed but on it. Don't have like, um, not necessarily. Rating or, or not like the doctors, uh, yeah, <laughs> rate my MD. There is no rate my builder, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. So yes. Can you say in our pre-construction yeah. website? Can you, yeah. can you say that those uh, developers are good? Usually, the build the products that we bring with, to you are reputable builders. So um, you guys are all aware that we have um, an info session about the um, uh, Panama and Costa Rica uh, vacation slash. Um, investment properties right now it's happening between 12 and 1 and the developers actually here to present the project to you it's going to be a quick one hour info session and we will be serving lunch so if, if you don't have any appointments and you can uh, stay behind feel free to do that it's going to be a very informative session about very affordable uh, pre-construction purchases in Panama and Costa Rica which will actually make your clients or yourselves money in the in firm as well Okay, thank you all for being here.